Hi, welcome to the Noise Path. Now, I'm by no means a watch collector or even a watch enthusiast, but I've always really liked skeleton watches because they reveal the internal mechanical mechanism that makes the watch go. And looking at these mechanical devices, try to keep time, is just fascinating. Now, not every watch can be turned into a skeleton watch so simply because when these movements are first created, they're created with a certain assumption on how the watch is put together. And in order to make a skeleton watch, you need to take away a lot of material. This watch is actually partially transparent. You can see my finger right through it. And I'll show you the back of it as well, which is also made of glass. And that's how you can see all the internal structures. Which means that if you want to make a skeleton watch from the ground up, you actually have to design the entire movement mechanism specifically to be able to be exposed to a certain degree like the one you see here. And this watch was made by Raymond Whale, which I think is one of the only privately held Swiss watchmaker companies left. I'm not quite sure about that, I just did a quick search to find out. And I think it runs a little fast. Now, changing these requires completely opening them up, which I'm not ready to do on this watch. But nonetheless, I thought we would like to measure it and see how it performs. In the back of it, you can see that this is a US limited edition, and I think it says a serial number on this one is 183 out of 200. I think they were planning to make 200. And you can see the self-winding structure in the back. That wheel will spin around as your hand moves around, and it doesn't matter which direction it spins, it actually always winds the coil. And the coil can be visible there right underneath the number 12. And that's what essentially stores the energy which runs the watch. There's no battery in these, of course, and they're all powered by your movement, or you can wind them manually. So I thought maybe we can take a couple of close look at it under the microscope just because it looks so cool. And then I want to show you the device that can measure how accurately this thing runs and see how fast or slow it is running. That should be interesting too, and we can then take apart the unit that does the measurement and do a couple of experiments with it, which I think would be quite fun. So let's take a closer look at some of these mechanisms that are really so mesmerizing to watch. Now what you're looking at is the balance wheel. And the balance wheel is connected to the balance spring in the middle, and the balance spring allows this balance wheel to move in one way, winding it, and the other way, unwinding it. And that creates a certain time constant. And that time constant is, of course, the time constant of the watch. That's what allows it to maintain a particular rhythm. This is all mechanically determined. Now, you can see there's two adjustments, one over here, which is the end of the spring, and another one over there. You could wind or unwind the spring partially. That changes the time constant, and therefore adjusts the timing of the watch, which you would have to take the whole thing apart to get to, which I'm not going to do right now. And then there's another adjustment over here, this one, and you can move that back and forth, and that changes the hysteresis of the wheel. So the time difference between it winding one way versus the other way. All of this, interestingly, can be measured by the sound the watch makes. If you look over there, you can see the pallet wheel, focus on that, and it's striking the scape wheel. And that striking is powered partially from the spring, which we'll see in a second. That's what stores the energy of the watch. But that then continuously regulates, it's like a positive feedback. It puts energy back into that spring, allowing it to continuously run. Now those purple points you see, those are synthetic ruby. Synthetic ruby is really hard, brittle material, and it allows you in, uh, to interface two things together without it having to wear out. If you have to have metal on metal contact, you imagine you can build a ball bearing, but here you cannot because of the dimensions. If you look at the pallet wheel striking the scape wheel, imagine that happens in this watch at a, at a rate of four hertz. So you have this this pattern over here at 4 hertz, and there's another one on the other side, and they together make a sound that runs around 8 hertz. We will see how we can use that to do this measurement as well. But this has to last decades, and so all these mechanical pieces moving on top of each other with the rubies and all the friction against each other, these things have to last a long time. Really amazing. So here you go, that's the other side. You can see that we have the main spring. That's what stores the energy of the watch, which slowly will unwind over time, connected all the way through there, and of course to the escape wheel. So it's a beautiful mechanical structure. This has been around for a long, long time. There's a lot of the art is making it look a certain way. So let's look at the other side there. And from the back, we can see the balance wheel striking the escape wheel again, a little bit better actually looking at it. And over there, you can see the little piece of epoxy that is used to connect the spring to that adjustment point. And of course, the energy is then carried forward and moves the hands of the watch. And from the back, we can see some of the main spring that stores the energy of the watch too. And this big piece over here, that's the wheel that charges the mainspring, of course. Now, Synthetic Ruby also has a refractive index of 1.7. So we should be able to pass some light through it and see the polarization effect. It might look really pretty. So I'm going to put it underneath the other microscope so we can take a look at it as the last thing we see. And then we're going to go and use the sound using the machine and characterize the watch. So here's the mechanism looking at it with regular light illuminated from the top. It is so mesmerizing. You can almost hear the sound it would be making in your head. But now let's switch the light from the bottom and polarize the light so we can see through the rubies and see the effect on the polarization.
and take a look, isn't that the coolest thing? So we're looking at light from underneath, which is polarized with a particular polarization angle and configuration. And then we have the two rubies that are striking back and forth. Now as they move, their angle slightly changes because they're not perfectly flat. And depending on the angle, of course, of a crystal like this, you're going to get a different polarization effect. So therefore, a different wavelength is filtered. So the color looks like it's jumping back and forth. This actually really does happen. It's not an effect of the camera. If I look at it through the pure optics, I see exactly the same thing. In fact, the dynamic range here doesn't do it justice. This. It's quite a bit nicer with the naked eye, of course. As far as I know, I don't think anyone's ever recorded the watch mechanism under these conditions, seeing this particular effect. I think it's really, really cool. But if you've seen it before, please do let me know. We may as well also x-ray the watch. Now my x-ray machine is only 35 kilovolts and it doesn't have enough photon energy to go through the lot of metal that this watch is made of. But we can see the transparent areas of the watch and it goes right through that. The front and back sapphire glass is mostly transparent to x-ray, allows us to see right through it. Interestingly enough, we can see the spring inside a little pin that holds the leather strap. Now the strap itself is almost completely transparent at this amount of exposure, so we don't see it, but the spring you can clearly see inside. It's really cool. This metal is really thin, so we can still see through it. A couple of other additional interesting things is that because this is a 19 second exposure, the individual little wheels on this gear are now all smeared out because it's been moving slowly in front of the image. But if you look at the pallet fork as well as the escape wheel, it has these distinct individual feet even though it's been constantly spinning. That's because it spends very little time in between these two states. It's almost a quantized state it has because it rapidly shifts from one into the other and you can see the ghost image of the pallet fork in these two positions as well. Kind of neat to see the amount of information you can get just by looking at even an x-ray with so little details. And here's the multifunction time grapher that I picked up from Amazon. Now, at the back of this unit, there's a few interfaces. You can connect a microphone here. It has its own little apparatus. I'll show you that. The power, and there is, interestingly, a frequency calibration USB port, but there's no information about how to use that. It must be something they used in the factory to tune out whatever crystal they're using inside of it. Now, in terms of its function, it runs a reasonably simple software. It essentially listens to the sounds of the pallet fork and the balance wheel, and it measures the timing between various parts of that sound. And from that, like the heartbeat, it figures out the beats per minute or beats per hour, as well as even the deflection of the balance wheel, because that timing and the angle of the deflection, which you have to tell it for the pallet fork, will tell it exactly how far that wheel is spinning. So pretty sophisticated when you look at another surface, but fundamentally all it is doing, really looking at and listening to the sounds of the timing between them. So we'll open it and take a look inside of what it looks like. Now the microphone that it comes with, which looks like this, is an interesting apparatus itself because it allows you to basically rotate it in a few degrees of freedom. I think it also goes this way. And the reason you would want to do that is because when you put the watch in here, you want to see if the gravity or the orientation of the watch has any effect on how it runs. And you can imagine for a mechanical component that will have an effect. Even for crystals it has an effect because gravity does affect them too. And I don't see any place for a hole for the sound to go through, so I think this is all mechanically coupled. And it's essentially using the conduction of sound through this to measure it and pick it up from there and, and essentially connect to the instrument. That's a you know, reasonably nice construction. So let's go ahead and put the watch in it and see what it says. And here's the watch already installed in the microphone facing up and it's fully wound up. And sometimes when you wind the watch completely like this, it does change the rate a little bit. But nonetheless, it has to be good, of course, across its entire range. So let's see if it figures it out. Light is blinking, that's good. You can hear the clicking sound as it locks to the watch. And let's give 10 seconds or so. So it's detecting the 28,800 beats correctly. It says it has about 0.2 milliseconds of hysteresis, which is a little too high actually. And deflection angle of about 290 degrees, which is healthy. And yes, the watch, as you can see indeed, is running about 12 seconds a day too fast. Now the spec for this watch is from minus 5 seconds to plus 20, which to be honest, I'm quite surprised for a watch like this to have such a wide range of being inaccurate essentially. Uh, this is again adjustable, and if you take it to a watchmaker they can do this. I, again, I don't want to open it right now, but maybe there's something we can do in a future video. I know there are some really good YouTube channels that work on this. I'll put one here on the screen so you can see one of the ones I'm talking about. Now we know exactly what is going on with the watch, but we can actually find out if this thing is accurate or not by fooling it, by essentially playing a sound to it and pretending it's a watch and have it lock into it and it will tell us its own internal accuracy. I also want to see what's going on on the inside and from that experiment we can also know exactly how far we are. Although you can just calculate that from these numbers and find out what rates this is running. But we can emulate that using a test and measurement and get the same result. So let's try that out. And here's what's inside of the unit. Now based on what we think it does, we're looking for some amplifications of the microphone and some triggering on some edges. Essentially we need some comparators in there. So let's see how this works. So we have the DC input coming in. There's some regulations over here. This goes into the LCD. This is the LCD's backlight. 
There's another board down here for the buttons. We have our little buzzer there, and of course the USB interface. And I don't think there is really anything on the other side. And the signal from the microphone coming in, which I think is a biased microphone, comes in, there's a, a few quad low noise amplifiers there, again to be expected. To amplify, there's a few rail-to-rail -rail op amp over here. This is just 74,000 logic. And then we do have a comparator here. And I think that's essentially everything. So listen, amplify, chop it up into the appropriate sharp edges, and then send that into the core microprocessor in there. You know, some basic microprocessor that also controls the LCD screen. Now, the crystal is right over here. It's just nothing unusual, maybe a TCXO or just a, just a, maybe just a simple XO, because you can use a software in there to calibrate that. You're basically counting. So if there's an offset in the calibration of this, you can easily do that, and that's probably what this USB is for. Talks directly to this, and you can download the calibration coefficients into the processor, and then everything else is in software. And here's our test setup. We're going to use the Tektronix AFG31000 series to create 8 hertz pulses. These are 10% duty cycle square waves, essentially. One volt peak to peak. We're going to take that from channel 1 and feed it directly into a speaker. This is nothing more than just a regular speaker. We're going to drive those pulses, and that's going to make this make these clicking sounds. And that's going to be similar to what is coming out of the watch, and hopefully this is going to detect the beat rate, and from that we should be able to check to see how accurate its, its internal oscillation is, because this guy is very accurate. So that way we can measure the whole thing. And then we can adjust the frequency in here, and see what we can need to do to emulate that 12 or 13 seconds gain every day, and then from that we can judge how the watch is working. So let's enable the synthesizer here. There we go. So the light is blinking, that's a good sign. And let it average for a little bit. It does say 0 seconds a day and it does detect the beat correctly. So that's, the beat rate is correct, which means that the 8 hertz is indeed being picked up correctly. And it says zero, 0 millisecond hysteresis, not surprising. And this number is meaningless because we don't know the exact timing to calculate this, but we could calculate it if we really wanted to, but 0 seconds a day. Now 0 seconds a day when it comes to timekeeping for instrumentation, I mean, that's a lifetime. So of course, pretty much any instrument is going to be perfectly fine for this purpose. But I'm going to adjust the frequency, instead of it at 8 hertz, I'm going to go up by 1 millihertz and see what the consequence of that is. So here's 1 millihertz, you can already see that this is gaining. So we're going to have to wait a bit for it to stabilize. And it has stabilized, and that is 10 seconds a day. And if you calculate 1 millihertz and 8 hertz, it will indeed become 10 seconds a day. So it means that the watch, instead of running at 8 hertz, is running a little bit faster. It's not that much, but of course, for something you want to wear many days at a time, it can get a little bit annoying. So I think this is a pretty cool experiment. It also tells us exactly how this time grapher works, that you can fool it. You can basically pretty much do anything you want once you understand the mechanism of the operation. And there you have it. I hope you enjoyed this rather unusual episode on the channel. As engineers, we can't help but to go down the rabbit hole. Even basic things in life can have a whole bunch of additional joy when you dig down and take the equipment apart, figure out how it works, even fool the equipment to do something that it wasn't intended to, so you can see exactly how it works. I'm going to reach out to the other gentleman on YouTube to see if he can guide me a little bit on what to do about adjusting this watch, and maybe something that even he wants to work on, since he does a lot of sophisticated work on these kind of things. I enjoyed working on this as well. I hope you liked the images as well as the experiment. As always, let me know in the comment section. See you next time.